Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Season 2, Episode 7 of A Studio of One's Own. My name is John, and I'm the host of the show. This series of dialogues is proudly presented by DEC and seeks to connect audiences to photographic practices from across the region. Season 2 of A Studio of One's Own spans eight episodes, with new episodes airing live on a fortnightly basis. At the end of tonight's 45-minute conversation, we'll be keeping 15 minutes for questions and answers from the audiences. So do put in your questions into the Facebook Live comment box. Joining us tonight is Singaporean photographer, Geraldine Khan. Geraldine's work focuses on using photographs to talk about the living conditions of migrant labor in Singapore. And her interests include family, mental illness, and land space issues in the country. Using the act of photography as an introspective method, she wishes for her images to challenge and evoke questions. Questions that we have many to answer tonight. <laughs> her interests has, have recently broadened to include situating photographs within installation and thinking about the architectural potentials of an exhibition site. Geraldine has participated in several community-oriented projects as well. Geraldine is also the co-editor of Left to Right, an anthology of lens-based images made in Singapore a publication we will talk a little about later as well. Hi, Geraldine. Thank you for joining us tonight for this conversation. Hi, John. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone on Facebook. Can't see you. Feels a bit weird, but hello anyway. <laughs> yes. So, so you know, how have things been going for you? Is it a long day for you today? Oh, super long. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I was, as I was mentioning earlier, yeah, I had, I, I had a class in the afternoon from two to five. I had a talk from 10 to 12. So, um, I'm pretty much brain dead right now. So I'm doing my best to, <laughs> to stay alive. <laughs> yes. Okay. We're going to like, try to keep this jolly for the next hour that we're going to go at this. And I think the time is going yes. to fly by, like literally zoom <laughs> fast, really fast for us. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, for really the entirety of the series so far, it's now our tradition, you know, to start like every episode by delving a little into like the history of the photographer, retracing their practice from the start. And, you know, so to really get the ball rolling, I was hoping you could share a little about yourself. How did your interest and engagement with photography begin? Well, my origin story, uh, it's actually it's not, not that interesting, not that dramatic. So uh, I basically started uh, with a phone camera when I was in junior college. So I was an 18 year old, right? Just playing around with my phone camera. Uh, so I started off uh, really photographing a lot of my JC classmates. Uh, so I did um, a lot of portraits of them. Uh, and I realized that, um, you know, people like, yeah, people had good reactions to the photographs. Uh, I also back then I had a little blog like on life journal when it was still like a thing uh yeah and I, you know, I had one too yeah. I had one too right right so yeah that, that's how old we are um yeah, yeah and uh yeah I, I would like you know take uh pictures of like you know, you know daily poetic moments and I would write like you know small captions of all those images uh so in general I found that photography was really a way for me to connect um to the world uh, especially people. So I think, yeah, the, the portraiture of my classmates was, was really something that impacted me a lot because, you know, I, I started to, I realized that I could see them in a, in a different way and, and they saw themselves in a different way as well. So, uh, so from there, I decided um, to pursue uh, art at the degree level. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so I enrolled into the School of Art, Design, Media and NTU and I applied to major in digital photography. Yeah. Right, right. And, and that kind of nicely segues into the, the next question, oh. you know, um, <laughs> especially on the note of like relationships. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of your early projects was In the Raw. Mm. And um, it really struck me when I read the caption that you attended to the artwork on your own personal website. And you wrote about, you know, the project's conceptualization as an icebreaker almost, you know, between your family, as well as to introduce your family to the issues you deal with as an artist. And I'm personally of the mind that, you know, within the Asian context, especially the Singaporean context, the decision to pursue art as one's career path, um, I guess in some ways you have a similar trajectory because I also came from JC, you know, right. it's sometimes met with a bit of perplexity by, you know, Asian parents. Was that something that was on your mind when you conceptualized the work? 
Oh, totally. Um, so I mean, I made this series in the last year of university. It was my final year project. So I was like 22 going on 23 at that point. Um, and I, I guess this was sort of my way of, uh, you know, sort of showing to my family that this was my decision. I wanted to be doing this, you know, for some time to come. Um, and, um, and I think, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, my, my parents always like re re recount like this this conversation that we had or or that I that I actually don't recall having. So which is that uh, uh, I actually didn't tell them that I was applying to art school. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I know I was quite like yeah I was quite shocked. You know, I think I don't know. I, I actually don't remember like the yeah like the moment I submitted my the moment of submitting like, my university application. But yeah, so I think they, they were concerned right from the get go because you know um. I think for obvious reasons, like I think those in the industry know we have a relatively small market, like no one here at that point in time, right? Like 10 years ago, I think you could easily say that very few people understood what art is or, or, or understood its value uh, to begin with. It really was not a part of our cultural uh, environment at all. Uh, so, so yeah, so, so doing the work was a way to, yeah, I guess to, to showcase yeah, my, my identity as a person, um, you know, not, not just my decision to, to apply to art school and be an artist, but, but also to, I think, in a way, communicate to my family, like, you know, the kinds of things that I, I was thinking about uh, and, and find a way to, uh, to, to relate to them better or to start relating to them better. So I always say, like, um, at the point of time when I conceived the work, um, I think I was, I was really not, contented with like the, the state of of the family yeah like our relationships so we were we were quite like emotionally distant uh there was also a little bit of trauma at least personally for me yeah uh within the family so and and i wanted to find a way to redress that but i couldn't do it with words so i mm -hmm. i decided to use yeah like the the platform of photography uh you know to involve them uh and and i think cultivate a sense of personal agency Mm. Um, yeah, to, to then begin, you know, doing like the real work of, right. yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, like bettering, you know, my, my relationships uh, with, with my family. Yeah. Right. I, and I'm a little bit curious, you know, like, um, you know, because I also can think back of my own experiences and I had to literally con my parents into believing that, you know, I was actually going to do something management related since I did arts management. Oh, damn. Yeah. So I was like, oh, no, it's, manage it's, it's, largely, <laughs> it's largely management. And, and even then there was still like, um, like, wow, we were like worlds apart, at least conceptually. And here oh, you okay. managed to like, essentially convince your parents, your, your, your whole family, you know, to, to be part of a shoot. And the most interesting is that, you know, one of the integral parts of you know the series is uh the nudity how did you oh, partial la. i mean yeah, I, partial, I, partial I, nudity, I, yeah. i'm the only one who's fully new like no 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 one else is yeah okay yeah. Anyway, so. how, how do you like like kind of get them to accept that idea um to be honest it wasn't that difficult uh surprisingly la. okay so oh, wow. my yeah my family okay so my family is like chinese singaporean and yeah catholic so mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm personally not Catholic, but my family is Catholic. So yeah, yeah so, <laughs> so I think people were wondering like, wow, like how did you convince a Chinese Catholic family like to you know to do something like that? And I think they are also surprised when I tell them, you know, it, it actually wasn't that difficult. I think I think it helped that it, it's a school project. <laughs> mm. Okay. Yeah. So I think that, that gave me a, a lot, a lot of uh, leeway. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, folks need you to like take off your clothes from a school project. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly but 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 here's also a lesson for me right so i think i learned something about my family as well that you know even despite being um chinese and and mm -hmm. catholic yeah so they they're also surprisingly open um mm -hmm. in their own way um yeah and and also extremely supportive so so i think i i got i got quite a bit of reassurance uh, that, that that you know that um yeah, that they that they would support me in their own way. They may not be on the same page conceptually, right? I mean, to yeah, yeah to, to parrot you, but uh, yeah, but you know, they yeah, they support in their own way, lah. Yeah, and they, they show their love in, in this way. So I I was actually quite touched by that. Yeah. So right, 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 and and that's something that I can completely relate to as well. And you know, following that the creation of the work, yeah, uh, it was actually showed quite extensively. You know, locally. Um, it was shown three times, uh, as well as an exhibition uh, in the Netherlands. And I'm sure that would have been a moment of pride for your, your family as well. How did they react to that? 
<laughs> was that was that like the light for sort of like oh that this is what my my daughter is doing? Yeah, I'm trying to recall. Uh, you know whether whether my parents attended any of the local uh, exhibitions. I think, I think maybe they um, I I did a talk at uh at old school. So back when Deck was at old school, right? So yeah, like two nine oh two at that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then I think there there was an artist talk. Uh, and then I think my father attended. So I think and and I explained uh you know a little bit about uh you know why why I made the series and I saw him like tearing in the audience and then I I felt like really really bad <laughs> yeah I felt I felt really bad and then yeah uh, then of course I I yeah I spoke to my father after that and uh and then I I realized like you know like uh yeah I think he 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 also understands like what was wrong like from from his point of view and it was nice difficult but but you know necessary and and nice uh, essentially to have that conversation with him um yeah I I guess like uh I mean my my parents never really like express like pride for their children uh but but I think you know just from you know showing up to my exhibition supporting me like logistically or something like that and and not like condemn condemning me for being that part. <laughs> I think I think that yeah that that is their language of showing love and pride uh. so yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's also very, very interesting because, you know, in the description of the work on your personal website, um, you mentioned, and I'm quoting you here, I have also chosen to include Ferry, oh. our domestic helper from Indonesia who has been with us for 10 years. And yeah. uh, for me, you highlighting this, you know, within the text, she stood out to me more than Ferry mm-hmm. stood out, you know, amidst the family portraits that you had captured. And, you know, when... When, when I read it, it felt more like a, a factual statement. It was, it was like more than a factual statement about, you know, the individuals who are within these uh, uh, photographs, but it was almost like an indirect message that you had for your audiences, for the viewers of, of these image. And, and over like the past decade, you know, migrant labor has been this recurrent theme in your, in your practice. How yeah, do you at see... different like, levels, yes. Yeah. yeah. How do you see like photographic practices impacting your lives or, or as a tool for societal change in general perhaps wow that's such a big question <laughs> yeah that's like we're, 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 we're going to like dive like right into it <laughs> 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 yeah. heavy going, get, get, get heavy, heavy going from here yeah that's so heavy uh okay okay Be- before i get to that question though um yeah. i think i i kind of want to to address like the statement uh the yeah, yeah. like the, the clause that you you actually extracted um yeah. Yeah, so so uh, so I I did mention that I chose to include her as family, right? So actually, yeah, I don't know, maybe I don't know, is it okay to talk about it here? Okay, but anyway, uh, so, uh, so throughout like the works, the later works where where I, where I do focus on uh like domestic help, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I I I eventually realized that actually um she did not see us as family in a way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So so you know I think um. So I guess what, what I'm trying to say is that I think early early on like yeah I was I was quite uh, aware uh and or maybe not 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 no maybe not yet aware like, I think I was trying to acknowledge and process mm. like her presence in the family um and uh, yeah and and also maybe work through like some some kind of guilt yeah you know about about being in a family that hired a domestic helper yeah so okay maybe, but maybe i can i can delve into that like later on uh, when we yeah. yeah address the other work uh but okay to tackle your very big loaded question uh how do how do i see photographic practices impacting the lives uh of migrant workers well may, maybe maybe i i need to sort of uh like detail like the various channels of photography i mean it's also not like one monolithic type of photography yeah. so there's like the images that put out right like by the ngos uh they mm-hmm. are very uh, advocacy driven um so they are very direct uh one dimensional in in message in messaging right usually because that's mm-hmm. I, I feel like that's what's required um for yeah for that kind of work and very important work at that um, and then like there's the kind of images that artists put out, uh, including the like, filmmakers. So as I was like doing all the later stuff, so I, I was looking at uh, like Quaron's film. Uh, I was looking at uh, a lot of documentary photography, uh, including like Sim Chien, uh, yeah. Jonathan Mawa. Yeah. 
um, and just studying like how how they went about like tackling this subject yeah of of domestic help uh, yeah so I think like those those kinds of projects tend to tend to I guess embody subjectivity a little bit more they 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 are less quick to uh, condemn like a certain aspect of policy, right? Of of being yeah. uh, in this line of work, um, and so so those works in general are better at capturing complexity, and then there are also the images that are put out by uh, migrant workers themselves. So, uh, in the context of Singapore, I think that there have been quite a few like photography type workshops, and you know, like and the poetry, the migrant poetry scene is like really really. Yeah yeah like alive yes um yeah so a lot of them you know and and with the proliferation of um like mobile technology um social media so like you know their, their own like they they you know they now become easily like their own photographs like a fo like something i put on facebook is kind of comparable equal like or at least seen in a more or less equal way yeah yeah it's kind of like mediated people. through the through yeah. the internet yeah right right, right. It, yeah yeah exactly exactly so um yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, let's see. So I I don't I don't know if I'm I'm answering your your question, but um, so like I and also I think you asked societal change. Like how does that lead to societal change? Uh, that's a hard one, isn't it? Like what kind is of that even is that, that even like do you think like when you even go through this process, like is is that like even part of like the goals, the objectives? Um. I think I think that was a that was a big point of confusion for me. As 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 in, I think I I was, I was constantly like wondering like why I was making the work. Yeah. Yeah. In a way, and and I think uh at some point you know I asked myself if I'm not part of an NGO if I'm not like trying to, you know, be a case worker help a migrant worker legally <laughs> or something, okay. um. Yeah, then then what are my images really doing? No? So I think for me, like I, I settled on the answer of um, you know, I think it took me a while, but eventually uh, I managed to sort of settle on um and just embodying like the, the voice of an artist slash like documentarian mm -hmm. um who's interested in you know pointing towards certain complexities and you know like it's not black and white, like there's just so much gray. And I had just I just had to be comfortable like being in the gray. Yeah. Yeah. yeah indeed, indeed. And yeah. um, but at the same time, you know, the, the images that you create are, are very, very powerful. And you know, um, since 2017, uh, you have been working on um, this project titled like Live In Mattress Provided. Yeah, and, right. And that project I to me eloquently evidences like quite a host of issues surrounding um, the rules pertaining to foreign domestic help in Singapore. It was, it's exceptionally interesting and timely that, you know, just earlier this year, you know, this thing was brought up again, you know, must domestic help in Singapore necessarily be live-in on account of, you know, the potential problems that is associated yeah. with live-in help. And so as much as I'm cognizant of um, the circumstances that, you know, you have portrayed pertaining to their sleeping areas, you know, as a person who has, has grown up without domestic help. The images of like mattresses in, in living rooms, um, beside medical beds, you know, they, they are a troubling sight for me, but I think they are made troubling precisely because I imagine them to be an exceedingly normalized scenario for a number of people um, in Singapore, you know? And, and so within the project Live In Mattress, you have made the site of rest you know, as the focal point of this series. You know, what led you to pick up on this particular strand as opposed to other aspects of a domestic helper's lives? Mm, yeah, uh, I think at this point in time, I was, I was quite um, focused on the specific policy. Uh, right. that, yeah, and, and um, that that mandates uh domestic workers to live with their employers like it's the i if i'm not mistaken correct me if i'm wrong uh yeah if i'm not mistaken it's the only line of work that an employee yeah. is required to live with an employer yeah. so um and you know i'm not trying to criminalize like all employers like oh like you're bad for hiring a domestic helper yeah i live with one for so many years yeah uh yeah um 
yeah, so it's it's not about that, but um, and and there are many many employers who are very good to their employees, right? So yes, of course. No, no doubt there. But the point is that a policy like that uh leaves it leaves it up to chance a little bit too much. Like the domestic mm. has you no know, way of finding out who the employer is, and you know, off and you know, if shit goes down, then yeah, uh, it it goes down, and they and they're very uh little. Uh, room for yeah I think aid and, and proper like yeah recourse uh, for their situations yeah and in, mo- in some cases like people end up dying and, and you don't and you ask yeah. like why like you know you know could that have been prevented yeah like, at some point yeah so anyway so I was very focused on on this um policy I think this was like the, the quite outstanding yeah, yeah aspect of being a, a a domestic helper and so I wanted the images to to point towards um yeah the policy so the mattresses are in a way uh, a kind of very <laughs> um well direct and also oblique yeah i guess like yeah uh, way of, of of pointing towards this thing la. so you see the yeah. mattress and you see you see the environment that surrounds the mattress um yeah some 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 of it is like cramped like like the one you like the like the one you just saw that's like in the living yeah. room and and then some are like you know uh really grand like luxurious types of bedrooms yeah 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 so of of course like you know the the beds in themselves like don't necessarily say anything about about the experience but i think it it's a way of i think just it's it's a good window i think at the very least into yeah in, into what's happening and a good starting point for a further conversation yeah yeah and and also there's like one more aspect you know that you you chose to actually quite kind of leave out in the creation of these images and Mm -hmm. you you chose to omit the personal effects of these workers and like like for me like the way that i i i read that decision was that um you know it's it's almost kind of addressing this preconceived notion of of um helpers uh, within the Singaporean context, you know, they're like almost like labor droids, you know, they require nourishment and then a docking station, you know, they, they do not come with any baggage whatsoever, you know, and, and that's almost like how I see it. And I, I think that when I, I perhaps, you know, read about these cases of, of abuse, right, that's what I think that those people are thinking. So what was like going through your mind when you made like that decision? Mm, yeah, I mean, I, I think this question also ties back to what you asked me earlier about why why am I not interested in like the I guess yeah. more personal or subject yeah. like aspects of their lives, right? Yeah. Uh, I think I I really I really was not interested in in uh, revealing like who these women are. Mm. You know, like this is so and so from Philippines, this is so and so from Myanmar. Like these women are human. You know, <laughs> I think like. Yeah, we yeah. Were, We've heard like so much of that already. Yeah. And I think it's it's pretty obvious. La. Like, do I need to tell you they're human? You know? Yeah. And then what, what good what good would it do to I don't know, I guess to fix someone's identity in this way? Yeah, I think I really tried to avoid doing that. Uh so I so I took, yeah, so I made the decision to to just show like a, a bare mattress as a mm-hmm. yeah, as a as a well, not basic, well. Yeah, I guess for lack of a better word, right now because my brain is super fried, like basic <laughs> representation of the issue. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's also like worth like highlighting, right? That you know you mentioned that it should be noted that the living space is oddly defined for this woman. Is. the the site of work is like absolutely conflated with their place of rest and relaxation. In yeah. a number of these cases, in some cases they they are accorded like their own bedroom, um, which is lovely, but for, for numerous instances, like the numerous domestic helpers, you know, in housing development board flats, you know, they, they, it is absolutely conflated. Um, and, you know, this rule has, has been heavily criticized for leaving foreign domestic help, you know, very vulnerable to various types of exploitation, uh, long and unclear working hours, uh, mental health issues resulting from prolonged social isolation or even potentially abuse. So, and I, I was thinking that this is an exceedingly relevant thought for mm. our present times, you know, mainly because I think that people should be able to relate to it now better than ever yeah. before, right. given that Absolutely. so many of us have been like working from people home for the past yeah. two years, right? Yeah. And you also touch on these ideas and like the, 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 this, this, this conflation of the of the, the living space and uh, the, the, sorry, the space of rest and the space of work, right, in 
a subsequent project, aesthetic screening. And so I, well, very long preamble, but I have two lines <laughs> of, <laughs> I have like two lines of thought pertaining to this. You know, the first one is referring to, is, is with regards to mental health. And secondly, the evolution of spaces. And I think I'm going to go with asking you about the evolution of spaces first. Okay. So now like with this conflation of living and working spaces, like not being confined to migrant workers alone, do you think that this is going to like precipitate a change in society's approach to understanding the spaces that we inhabit? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're throwing really a lot of bomb questions to me right now. How do I answer a question like that? Um, okay, may- maybe I should elaborate a bit on, on the, the series first, now, I think. For, yeah, um, on aesthetic screening. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, <laughs> just, yeah. Uh, okay, so it's basically um, a series where when I went about uh, photographing uh, yeah like uh, what, more than 100 uh, bin centers in Singapore. So it's a, it's a very like uh, shy, I would say it's a very shy body of work because I'm mostly standing outside the buildings and trying to like peek in to see, you know, if I can, yeah, to, to see, yeah, to see what I can capture. And what I was interested in capturing was if there was any evidence of, um, you know, like men who are, who, are, who are turning these like private, no, sorry, no, these public, you know, the public, actually the public buildings uh, into private or actually semi-private types of spaces. So uh, I, I started working on this to begin with because I, I actually read like, um, yeah, a report about, you know, um, migrant workers being asked to live in, um, yeah, like the bin centers, like to actually lodge there officially instead of, you know, being mm-hmm. given like proper housing. Um, yeah, and, and, the, and so the report actually like, actually, yeah, like caught some like migrant workers, like you know, like actually like in in there in their like resting space. So there there'll be like this yeah. like thin mattress on the floor, and they were all the men were like you know uh, sort of caught caught in the headlights, uh, so to speak. Yeah, and, and and it was just sort of like a very shocking article, and I'm just wondering like why like you know a fifth of our population is, is migrant workers, and of course not not all of them uh you know work for yeah work as cleaners for our yeah. housing estates, but, you know, but still it's just, you know, it's just a, it's a constant uh, reminder of like the kind of, yeah, like segregations lah, that we, that we impose um, in our society. And, you know, the bin center is right smack in the middle of you know, all our residential, like yeah. at least public residential housing areas. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're like quite literally like next to them, but all this, you know, just, it just continues to remain like relatively unseen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I just thought it was important to yeah, like just visit like these buildings. Um, yeah, and a lot in a lot of the photographs actually, um, like you don't uh like you know in in some of the photographs like uh, I don't I don't I don't capture any like opening or like orifice of the building, so it's it's completely like shut or gated or like you know opaque so to speak. But you know in in my personal experience like on the site, like, I would actually hear like men behind like a, a shutter or a gate, and you know they'll be eating or you know listening to their yep. music or whatever. So yeah, so yeah, so I think I struggle also like, like with what the photos like could and could not show. I received a lot of feedback uh, that the world was very quiet, like they, these don't look like dangerous spaces. So, you know how do I? So how do you make me like the viewer feel? You know like your your what you feel like that kind of indignance and blah blah blah. Yeah. So. Uh, like for okay. me, for me, I think like I I I I got those images very very quickly because like just down the road from my place, there's yeah. also a similar bin center, yeah. and you know you you have these workers, you know driving these trolleys out which pull yeah. along yeah. The, the the garbage carts, and uh for me it's always, it's always been, it's it's already an exceedingly ubiquitous sight, but it's still very interesting to see to to note that like. Well, at, at least for the case of my particular bin center, they, they come out in the evenings freshly showered, out mm. from the bin center and heading home. There you go. There you go. Yeah. And and so it, it becomes so explicitly explicitly clear that you know this bin center, which is actually a place of refuse, right? It's also almost this place of um like where these individuals like clean themselves and prepare themselves for like uh almost different life, you know, in some cases, um, and not in others, which makes it all the more poignant for me, but right? Him, like the, the, the idea of like cleaning yourself in a place which is perceived to be dirty you know it's it's right. interesting yeah 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 I think, so I think I, I, yeah I mean on that note I mean I just want to share also like the people who gave comments like you know oh, but the bin center is not that dirty 
And I'm like, is that the point? <laughs> yeah, it's not <laughs> really not the, the point. point. <laughs> the point is it's a bit center. <laughs> like, you know. Yeah. Yeah, okay, but anyway, sorry. Yeah, so to me, it makes it like super clear. Like, you know, they want to, to, to like mark this delineation at like 6 p.m. They leave the bin center freshly showered, having showered inside the bin center. I, I'm not sure how. Okay, um, but, but good to know that your, your, like, the cleaners at your place leave at 6 p.m. Because sometimes, like, I don't know, some, some, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how like different uh, constituencies yeah. like you know like uh, handle like the schedules of yeah of, of the workers. So yeah, yeah. But, but in a lot of cases, I see like men working late into the night also. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, but, like compared to to like our foreign domestic help, you know, they, they don't really get to say that okay, it's six p.m. I'm going to like run yeah. now and like yes, that's live my own life. And I think that's a life that more of us are being able to relate to. Um, we are at home the entire yeah. time. We take our lunch at home. Yeah. Um. We are working at the same table we are taking our lunch at compared to in the past. Mm-hmm. So, like, proceeding along, like, that really long preambly run-on question that I had. So, do you think that this particular, <laughs> this particular experience is, like, contributing to, to this awareness, you know, that, that these spaces that we inhabit, they are changing? Mm, I have to think about this one. Uh, I think in the context of migrant uh, work, Mm. Uh, low okay, low wage migrant work because you know the definition of migrant work is very debatable. Uh, low wage migrant yeah. work. Um, I don't know. I think I think yes and no. I think I think I see some change like happening at least on on a policy level. So so like for example, I think I read a recent report. I can't remember like date, and 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 who and who was quoted in the report. But uh, I think on a minist- ministry level, I think something was said about like improving the dorm conditions for male migrants. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, but yeah, but I think that's a given considering how much it blew up <laughs> in our face uh, during the early stage of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, in terms of domestic help, um, I think the demand of domestic help is not going to go away. So I think at some point, I was I was literally asking myself, should domestic helpers be here? Should we hire domestic helpers? Like, should should we like you know? Like terminate this bilateral agreement with all these like source countries yeah, because this yeah. is that's how it's arranged, right? Um, yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah, and stop and stop that kind of labor from flowing in. And I realized that I don't know that kind of question is is really Im- impossible for someone like me to to answer. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay, but but anyway, uh, so uh, yeah, so in in short, I don't think uh demand for domestic help is going to go down. Uh, so, but but interestingly though, um, uh, there's something that, that's called the household services scheme, uh, and mm-hmm. I, yeah, right. So so that's basically I, I I haven't like gone into like the the full details of what this scheme is, but uh, but it's under but it's an M O M scheme. So but it seems like uh, it's a provision of part time like you know house cleaning help. Uh, yeah. I think probably from the same uh source countries. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and also I guess at a similarly like affordable rate. So so this one won't be a live-in uh type of arrangement. So it it'll be just like freelance, I think, or some kind of part-time uh yeah, like home cleaning type of service. Uh which I think is interesting. I I feel I feel like you know there's a little bit of uh like I think on the government level they're they're trying like slowly to like introduce these things without causing yeah. too much of a stir right uh from the ground. So uh yeah I mean I'm just curious to see like where this goes. Yeah. Right. And, and so okay then now I kind of se- segue into like the second part of that question I had which was you know, pertaining to mental health. And in many ways, you know, COVID-19 scenario I think has been like a, a perfect storm that you know it's been ex- Posing on negligence, not just towards issues of pertaining to migrant labor, but to mental health as well. I remember Absolutely. like during the yeah. first lockdown, um, psych- psychiatric treatment and psychological treatment was not considered an essential service. And I was like, wow, that's that's stunning. That, that that's rich. Um, and in 2012, right, your project, Black as Waves, Half as Light, you know, focused on this issue of mental health, um, following your affliction with anxiety. Um, could you share with us a little about you know how that project was developed, how it came about? Mm, right. So uh, at that point, I won an award and I broke down. So yeah. 
you know the two the two things don't really don't really compute like you're not supposed to break down after getting an award uh so i think that's what prompted me to really sort of uh try and understand what i was going through a little bit more so i've been yeah i've been facing anxiety issues for for a long time since i was a teenager so uh so in my early 20s I, yeah uh, it was when i i i decided like mm, have to have to sort of uh, I think gain deeper awareness and vocabulary, right? I think uh, about what I was experiencing. So uh, I guess you could say like this was my first attempt in a way at a more like participatory or like collaborative type of process. So I basically just like reached out, um, you know, to people informally, uh, you know, um, uh, and I, I wanted to sort of work with and include people who, were diagnosed either officially or self-diagnosed. I think I wasn't so concerned with, you know, like the medical like definitions or or those yeah. kinds of like yeah um details. Um yeah, so either self-diagnosed or diagnosed with a form of mental illness and to try to um make an artwork that would capture the experience, yeah, of of shouldering this condition uh, over time. So um yeah, and it yeah, so surprisingly, I, I don't know why it also was not difficult to find people. Uh maybe because I don't know in art, like you know, there's a there's a big stereotype, right? Like, oh like yeah. artists are like well, people in the arts are like very like moody or like you have a lot of emotional problems, and that's why you make your art or something. I don't know. Uh no lah, but I, I feel I feel like um in in a, in a way something like that was was meant for me like to to learn to learn from. And I think like, you know, I found I found all these people because um yeah it would it would sort of really not serve me per se but you know I don't know I just felt like I was meant to yeah to connect with them and to to share with each other and um you know sort of find solace yeah with other people who were going through like their own mental health issues. Uh so in terms of um like creative control, uh I think different people sort of have different uh, ideas on on how how yeah. involved like they want it to be, so those who are artists, um, I think had more like they were of course much more like forthcoming with ideas and blah blah. And then those who are not like artistically exposed, um, I think they they wanted me to make the decision a little more, um, yeah. And then um, I also actually had my own piece. So uh, this this was made like just by myself. Like I took I took on this liberty, I guess, um, as or slash responsibility, I guess, as the initiator of the project. So it's actually like this like little calendar book thing. Sorry, some water is mm. put on it, so that's why you see the stain. Um, <laughs> wait, can you no blur? Okay, but anyway, it's like a calendar like book. Uh, yeah. so I, I tried very hard to be very like reflexive about the whole process. So so that little publication, um, yeah, I think um documents a lot of like my learning experiences. Lah. Like so there were conflicts also at some point. Like people like one or two of them thought like, I was too focused on the outcome and you know I wasn't like listening, actually listening to what they were going through. People came in and they also left the project. So yeah, and then so all that kind of like went into um that little like like book yeah artist book so to speak yeah, yeah. So, mm. and, and, and what, what, yeah 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 you, you did you did you did uh, but it also has prompted like 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 more curiosity from me because you know you not talked about like this idea of um control you know mm. in, in how that the project is going to come out you know about the process and you know there's of course this there's a large number of artists who you know also create work based on um, whether it's the, their personal challenges, emotional instabilities, or mental illnesses. Um, and some of these artists take very, very introspective approaches. And you know, it's uh, something which is something purely personal. They do it by themselves and absolute control of that artistic output. Right. And you have kind of like diverged from that, and you like you are you are willing to like kind of like like distribute a bit of that control in terms of doing this particular project. Um, do, is, was there something that led you to go in that direction? You know, um, to bring together different people under this initiative, as opposed to just pursuing something by yourself, working it out by yourself? Right. Um, I, I don't think this was something that uh, that came to me like, super consciously I think it's just yeah. like my general like way of working so you know with the family work uh, like the first mm. thing I do is like reach out to family 
you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. and um and I mean we we didn't talk about my earlier portrait work. So I mean, so before the family, well, I I was actually focusing quite quite strictly on like yeah portrait photography. But but because it allowed me to in a way like reach out to other people. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah so so I guess like it's it's kind of like my just sort of like my my way of working. I I wouldn't say it's something. I wouldn't say like from the get go I wanted to share control I don't think that was mm, really mm, my mm. mind yeah it was really just more like I'm a people person and <laughs> I want to learn to work with other people right right right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah 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 I exactly. totally get that yeah and all right so to all of our audiences who are tuning in tonight um before we get to like the final question that I have for Geraldine um I'd like to remind all of you to like put the questions into the F- Facebook live comment box uh, if you haven't because we'll save some time at the end of our conversation to answer the burning questions that you have um, while watching this conversation tonight. Um, and so with that, like, on to pretty much like my final, or technically it's two questions because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sub-question after my first, but uh, it's on to your publication. Um, uh-huh. I really admire that you pretty much co-edited, created, self-funded a publication. Um, and that was like left to right, left to right. You know, and it was co-edited. Oh, left, left to with, right, left to right. Left to right, yeah. Left yeah. to right. Left to and right. you know, um, it was co-edited with Kenneth Day and you invited artists, curators, and writers um, to respond to selected uh, lens-based images produced in or off Singapore. Yeah. Um, so how did this project come about? Like, what well, was this, the starting uh, point? <laughs> I guess this was this was like a yeah, response to like the S, like the SG fifty yeah. sort of like hoo ha, right? And then mm-hmm. it's all like celebratory uh like nation building type of imaging exercise, right? So much funding going to yeah, like all these different um efforts. Uh so I thought like I thought it would be important to you know take a bit of a critical pause. I think celebration is is fine, la. you know, I, I think as as long as it's it's considered and and not so like one tone and one dimensional yeah yeah so um and i think for for me like personally speaking when i was discussing the project with kenneth um i think the the way the way we approach people to come on board is to select an image uh specifically that and that inspired them or that influenced a big part of their practice so so in other words it's like you know giving tribute to to something that came before and i think um embodying this like spirit of generosity um, was was really important. Um, yeah, and I, I wanted to include more people. I think there are like 53, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, like 50-ish uh, people in the A public. big number. Yeah, it's a huge <laughs> so, number. Yeah, yeah I, was, <laughs> I went crazy coordinating everybody. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, wo- we both did. Uh, yeah. So, sorry, what was I saying? Uh, yeah, I wanted to include more yeah. people, but... Mm-hmm. But yeah, but at some point, I think it would have become unmanageable. So yeah, so the idea was was just to it was it was an exercise in gathering again, right? So similar, yeah. like yeah, reach out to people, bring them together, <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah get, gathering. Um, it's a, it's a book like by yeah by artists for artists in a way. Yeah, and, and as a as a way of responding to and being a bit more critical about mm. about how we see our country. Yeah, so. And, and you've des- described, you know, this book as both being, well, now you said a critical pause and, you know, before uh, in your abstract, you described it as a, a meaningful pause. Mm. Um, we, mm. Yeah, we live in a world that's like inundated right now with image generation and consumption. It's like it's Instagram, the infinite scroll, and uh, you can even kind of choose to scroll thematically as well these days. Um, so, you know, how do you envision these meaningful pauses firstly? Like, what does that meaningful what's it, what do you mean specifically by this meaningful pause? Do you mean is in the context a, of the book or just like in general, like in my life? Perhaps perhaps in general, like oh, in, okay. pertaining to like this uh visual culture that we are uh immersed in and unable to escape anymore. Right. Uh well, if I don't know if I can answer it from the perspective of like relating it to visual culture, but but one word that came to mind as you were like yeah. bringing out the question is is this idea of um, disconnection. Yeah, I think yeah. that's really been exacerbated during the course of the pandemic. So you know, like technology facilitates a lot of things, like screens facilitate a lot of things, social media facilitates a lot of things. But but you know, I think 
I don't know, like, I think for me, we, we have, in a way, also become increasingly disconnected, like, all this information also drains us uh, in other ways, and, um, and I think for me, like, right now, uh, 9 September 2021, uh, a meaningful pause is, is really understanding what true connection means. Yeah, yeah. Not, not, not just with, not just externally, but internally. So I think over the past year, especially like uh, has been a huge lesson for me in how to really like come home to who I am instead of uh, constantly being steered by external like motivations. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, yeah, you know, and maybe, maybe as, I don't know, as like visual creators, we, I don't know, like maybe we, we feel like a need to constantly like look at what's out there yeah and so that that can be a really like draining process and um you know you can you can lose yourself in in some way so um and i think i did lose myself at some point so so i think it's important to understand what disconnects you from you yeah right that yeah that for me is a meaningful pause right now right thank you so much for answering like like all of these uh well i ended up being quite heavy going questions <laughs> uh for me tonight um, in the and, pandemic, um, I mean, you know. Yeah, in the pandemic, yeah, in the pandemic. Uh, but I guess in some ways, our conversation is also a meaningful pause from everything else that we get about with, you know, as part of our regulated lives. Um, but now on to some of um, our audiences who's, who have been tuning in. And uh, of course, the number one supporter, uh, Gwen oh, herself. <laughs> Gwen herself. And, yeah. and, and Gwen asks, uh, Hi, Geraldine. I enjoy your presentation uh, exhibitions that incorporate the space as part of art experiential processes. For instance, oh. um, this way forward. Could you share a bit more of your process to arrive at this? Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I believe Gwen is referring more to like my installation type works. Uh, mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I don't think we can share any images of those. Can we? No, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, okay, I mean, thank you, Gwen, for the question, because I know, like, this wasn't really covered uh, in the conversation, but uh, I mean, okay, I'm going to try <laughs> to describe the project, uh, even though we can't, uh, yeah, you know, uh, in, in, in the absence of, of the, yeah, of the documentation of the art of work. So, uh, so the piece that you've mentioned, Gwen, this way forward, if you have a link, I can share. Yes, I, okay, Joadi says, yes, yes, I do have a link. Uh, hang on. Okay. Okay, there we go. So this is the piece that Gwen's talking about. Um, and I guess the viewers at home, you get to you, you will see that comment um being shared in the Facebook Live comment box. Okay, so I'm passing Juhadi two links. So one is to an artwork called This Way Forward. Another one is to a piece called By Unit of Measurement. So, okay, mm. so This Way Forward is basically, uh, so I don't know if Juhadi has that on the screen already, but so it's basically, uh, that was held at uh, ICAS uh, in LaSalle. So uh, that was in 2015, 14? Yeah, sorry, my memory. 15. 15, okay, great. Yeah, 2015. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so basically the entire gallery floor is covered with corrugated sheet metal. So at that point in time, I was quite, I was quite obsessed with the construction fence uh, as an object, as an image, uh, you know, as a metaphor and all like just a, yeah, like representation of, you know, all the construction that goes on in Singapore. Uh, and so I thought it would be fun to experiment with turning the fence on its side in a way <laughs> uh, and then sort of like have that as the as the thing that people step on in the gallery la. so the, the point of doing that was really to make people sort of hyper focused on where they were in the space because the corrugated sheet makes it difficult right to uh, you have to walk quite slowly and with every footstep you produce a sound and it's quite loud um yeah and the space is very echoey uh let's see yeah um yeah, so so like the the photographs on the wall are also mine. So the idea was really to to have people sort of like be be super aware. Like I think I was just I just wanted people to to be aware of of where they are in the space and where they are in relation to the artwork and ultimately uh you know in relation to the issues that in artwork. So that's a bit of a conceptual stretch, like, But I think for me, like that was what I got off to at that point. 
yeah um yeah but i think like the the drawback of this piece though i mean um i'm giving myself some critique right now so like the drawback of this piece is really that it it was only suitable for yeah for people who can walk because there were a couple of um visitors uh who were on wheelchairs and they were mostly just kind of like they, they could only sort of access like the the entire exhibition from the ramp so i felt a little bit like bad about that but 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 you know, overall, uh, I, I I do think it was a successful like experimentation for me at least, yeah, just materially and spatially. Um, and then the next one that uh, I like to highlight is called by unit of measurement. So that's the that's the one where I photograph a fence, a, a really long construction fence by Singapore standards, uh, from start to finish. So the whole thing is shot in 525 images. Yes, very yeah. substantial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is so this was actually uh right outside Wuli MRT at the Bidadari like HDB plot. So now like the, the fences are gone, like all the flats are up, and I actually know people who are gonna be moving into the flats soon, which is very surreal. Uh so yeah, so I just followed the fence uh from start to finish and it brought me through like quite interesting spaces so at some point I actually had to enter someone's house to photograph a fence yeah part, a part of the fence so so I did not know hi I'm doing this project can I just like go through your back yeah <laughs> yeah that was that was like a, a fun yeah like bit of the project for me how did but, that person respond yeah. to that like like say can I like take a, go to your back yeah take a photograph surprisingly without any hesitation like oh, oh okay <laughs> oh wow okay this is great to know but like you know this team, Singapore is like really game you know yeah, okay. Really. okay but okay, sorry to interrupt you there please go on <laughs> no no yeah but, um, yeah, but the, the point of the project I guess was to um especially in a way that stage right so in in two iterations of the piece uh so the one that Ju is showing right now uh, showing right now is uh at the was at the substation and you know it's a it's a fence i mean it forms a literal fence that that surrounds the other artwork that's in the space um i mean the whole show then was was also about like nature uh land space issues as well uh so yeah so i think in the way that the the, the this piece um manifested in two of the iterations so the second and the third one uh so Ju, can you go to the to the the one on the rooftop Yeah, 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 this one. Yeah, uh, the previous, yeah, 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 okay, this image, yeah, great. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, so in this one, I think I was, um, I, I really wanted to sort of uh, create a space that resembled a fence and that was filled with images of a fence for people to confront like the image of a fence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was just like fence on top of fence, on top of fence, yeah, in a way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, John. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, that's great. It's, it's, you know, it's um, spaced out. <laughs> yeah. Fence on top of fence. And I was like kind of like falling into the wormhole of like fence uh inception, you know, uh, pretty much right. at the same time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I guess that that well. I think that pretty much answers Gwen's question in a very, very detailed manner with uh, some tech wizardry from Juhadi on his side as well. I think that's the first time uh, we've actually pulled up um, a, a, web, a web page uh, live on air. So oh, really? That's, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, that's the, the newest thing that we have done on um, our program so far. And we've got like just a little bit of time left. Um, if anybody has one last burning question, do throw it into... Um, the comment box on Facebook Live. Um, this, this is going to be your only chance uh, because <laughs> we'll be ending the program pretty shortly. Um, but in the meantime, actually, you know, the pandemic is, is on my mind. You know, I, I, oh, I perhaps it. can't get over it. And, um, you know, how do you think that artists can best make use of <sighs> this particular period for creative development? Oh, good God. I'm probably the worst person to answer <laughs> that question right now. <laughs> For reasons I won't get into, uh, you know, in this public talk, sorry. <laughs> but wow, uh, how have how can artists best make use of the pandemic period for creative development? Um, I think I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna frame this response um based on things I've heard from uh, from fellow friends, yeah, who are artists and who have been actively making, uh, mm -hmm. during this period. I think um what what I what I'm taking away is that um. I think I'm quite flawed by, by the resilience that I'm seeing. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, like you make, you you continue making like in spite of, uh, you know, like the financial precariousness, like the increased financial precariousness. I mean, you know, I think a lot of artists are, yeah, like precarious before that. Oh my God, Jesslyn. Oh my God, my student. Oh, okay, so shy. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, we'll get to a question shortly. So, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite um, awed and I'm quite humbled by the resilience that I'm seeing. Um, and, in, in some ways or so, uh, another, another friend actually just recently told me that um, the pandemic has actually made artists realize that, um, you know, creation and collaboration especially um, can, can happen, you know, regardless, as long as you have like the technology to do it. Yeah, so I think in the past, like, um, you know, you always like fly people over, you know, to do projects, like to conduct a workshop, to, to, mm -hmm. to do a talk, et cetera. Uh, and you get to be in the presence of the artist, but I think I think since the pandemic, um, I think that has sort of like shifted a little bit, but but also for the better in the sense that you don't have to have someone to fly over for something to happen. You don't have to cancel yeah. something like you know like this is a legit way of making, yeah. right, and organizing as well. So um, yes, so I don't know if I'm contradicting myself uh, when I said earlier that we are sort of in a way more disconnected than ever. <laughs> but connected um, at the same time, like like I think it's yeah. uh, I. I yeah, like I'm not. I'm still not sure how to articulate that. Uh, yeah, long that long conversation. Or... You know, it proves that, that 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 Zoom is actually a very very viable platform for connection, as much as you know. Yeah. The pandemic is this exercise in disconnection sometimes, but you yeah. know, I think that your answer to that was perfect for us to like segue into. Uh, Jesslyn's question, you know, on the topic of creation okay. uh, and collaboration. Um, and so Jesslyn asked, Hi, Jess. um, "Hello, as you have worked with." and included different groups of people within your works. Going into future works, what other groups of people, communities, and topics would you like to work with? Wow, Jess. Okay, okay. The universe is forcing me to think about this. <laughs> this one <laughs> sent my student to ask me this question. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, I think I think I, I I have a few ideas, a few tangents. Uh, but but to be to be completely honest, like not, none of it is very concrete yet. Uh, I'm really in the process of deciding um who and what I'm going to work with and on. Yeah. Um. But but I think what I can say is that uh what what continues to drive me is is to think about like social inequalities and and maybe to find like, another way to talk about that. Uh, I'm I I I'm not actively planning like a, a huge like you know community oriented or socially engaged project like for the moment. Uh, I think yeah I think I'm I'm yeah. not in the right space for that right now. Um, but but I'm still continuing to think about um you know inequalities uh and mental health especially and and to see where that leads me. Yeah, sorry Jess, don't have a clear answer for you. <laughs> yeah. All right. And I think with that, uh, I think we can end tonight's conversation. Uh, let, I'll let you have like some rest, you know, giving you a really whole bunch of really heavy going questions after a very long day for you already. And so with that, thank you so much for joining us tonight on a studio of one's own, Geraldine. Um, thank, thank you so for much, taking Geraldine. the time to answer these questions. Um, and to all of the audiences who have joined in on our conversation tonight, um, thank you. Uh, and we would sincerely appreciate your feedback, um, which you can do by um, scanning the QR code that would uh, flash on the screen at the end of tonight's conversation. And while you're at it, um, if you enjoy um, these talks, you know, please donate to the Safe Deck campaign to allow Deck to have a permanent home. And with that, be sure to tune in for our finale episode, which will be taking place on the 30th of September, where we will speak to Vietnamese photographer Din Kiu Le. And I will catch all of you then. Good night. Thank you very, thank you very much once again, Geraldine. Thank you very much. Oh, and thank you, Deck, for having me. Thank you, Ju, for, uh, for managing the tech. I know it's a very stressful job. <laughs> yeah, and oh, hi, hi to my student, Karishma. I saw your message in the chat. Hello. Yes. Okay, okay good night. Bye. <laughs> good night. Thank you.